the person that impresses me the most is the person who show up. It's yeah. all mental. I have a lady in my class. She tore her Achilles and she wants to work out. Like she's standing on the side of me. I'm like, what you doing here? <laughs> yeah. But uh, my doctor just said I can't do. Like that's the person I want to train because those are the people you want to be around because they'll figure a way to to make stuff happen. You said you said it. You didn't get you didn't get the scholarship when you finished school. Right. Correct. Right. So a lot of people would see that as the end. It's not like a lot of people are afforded to chase their dreams once they hit that rocky wall. How do you tell someone else to stay on their dream? What are words are you going to use to push them to stay on that? You, you know, <laughs> I love the question because. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Fanatic Islanders, your home for sports and sports entertainment. Anton, the only Jimmy Mackey. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> All right. Thank I'll you let for having me. No problem. Thank you, for, thank you again for coming on. So I'll let him briefly introduce you. Um, don't worry. I'm behind the scenes. Makara's on camera. And let's roll. Oh, wow. All right. There we go. Oh, well, I got to start off with the first thing. I feel like all of us know you as a self-made man. Mm -hmm. All of us grew up on this. In this small country, I feel like there's a lot of people who have intrusive thoughts that kind of stunt their growth sometimes. They feel like uh, I, there's a lot of things that don't allow me to get ahead. A lot of things that disenfranchise me. So what is it within you that drove you to overcome those thoughts and to keep pushing? Right. I, I think it's um, a lot of it stemmed from my upbringing. You know, I came from, you know, like the average Bahamian from a place where, you know, financially it was unstable, um, relationship wise, you know, stability. And, you know, I kind of saw that as a negative in my life and I wanted to change that. It's kind of what I always tell my wife, you know, it's kind of breaking that mold, breaking mm -hmm. that system we all kind of grew up in and got used to and adapted to. Mm -hmm. And for some, it doesn't change. Some, it does. Um, and that kind of stemmed me from being around to moving in a different direction. Okay. My father, again, you know, a lot of the stuff that I saw, you know, him being an alcohol abuser, a drug abuser, it just... It changed the way I just look at life, my outlook on life at an early stage. I think sports help. Mm -hmm. You know, it pretty much took me out of where I was, my situation growing up, to uh, having, of course, the ability to see the world in a different light, the experiences, the mentorships, all of that help. Okay. So was there a pivotal moment, you would say, in your childhood that, like, mm -hmm. just pushed everything, like, immediately inside your brain you're just like i have to go yeah <laughs> like one I, moment i think um you know i had a i was in grade i think i was in grade 10 mm -hmm. 10 or 11 at the moment and my teacher asked the question what do you want to be when you grow up and i said to her i want to be a professional basketball player i can remember that now mind you i had no skill just yeah. pure athleticism like most bahamians right mm -hmm. and um my grades suck I think I probably was averaging at the time like a 1.25, whatever. I still have the report card to this day. Wow. In a frame. Yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of brings me back. And that that pretty much was like right there. Okay. Yeah. And it gave me uh, something to pursue. You know, I had a goal and, you know, eventually I made it to that, that, that space where I became a professional athlete. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. It's safe to say you did have a... Very <laughs> special <laughs> professional basketball career. So I know you start off at CI. CI Gibson, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you... Uriah McPhee, okay. CI Gibson, my junior year transferred to Tabernacle in Freeport. Uh -huh. Did one year, did one year there and didn't get a scholarship offer after my senior year. So wow. I, I didn't, I wasn't afforded that. All mm -hmm. of my teammates, everybody going to this school, that school, I'm home playing in the night league and uh, find a job. Wow. Working at the YMCA in, yeah. in Freeport, Grand Bahama. Yeah. Yeah. And my coach, Mr. Norris Bain said, you stay here for a year or you could go back, move back to Nassau, uh, develop your skill and um, you'll see what happens. No guarantees, no yeah. promises. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And work my butt off for a year and there you go. Wow. So how did that translate into you getting into Langston? Mm -hmm. So 
we played, we had a tournament in Dallas, Texas. Okay. I can remember it clearly. And coach pretty much, Mr. Ben, had an inbound play. Because, you know, I was very athletic. I had a 48-inch vertical. So <laughs> he set up an inbound play, and it was baseline. And I can remember clearly, call the play, snap the ball, and I jumped over four of the opposing team players. Tuhan slammed it in. And right after the game, the head coach, assistant head coach for Langston University walked up to me and was like, I want to offer you a full scholarship. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that's pretty much how I got into Langston University. So I guess just keep pushing on so every day, yeah. guys. <laughs> you don't know who watches. Yeah. Um I, I think a lot of a lot of athletes, mm-hmm. not just athletes, because you can kinda I use that terminology in everything I do because it's perfect for me. Yeah. And what I experience and in life, a lot of persons tend to get down on themselves. They tend to point the finger. They tend to do all of these different things, but look at themselves. At the end of the day, you have to look at you in the mirror and say, what am I doing right and what am I doing wrong? Mm-hmm. How can I get from point A to point B? What do I need to do? Sometimes you have to step way back in order to jump way forward. I and agree. we realize that stepping back for us maybe is too low. A lot of people don't understand my journey and my story. Yeah. After playing basketball in Europe, four or five, four to five years in the top league in Portugal, mm. being a starter or being a star player, I had to live. I moved to America. So well, let me rewind. I moved to the United States. My aunt lived in Atlanta, big house. But, you know, for me, that just wasn't who I was. Yeah. You're dependent. You know what I'm saying? I, I come up in a place where I, I used to work on Montague for tips, you know, cleaning fish, work on Paradise Island, jet ski sales, doing all that. Mm-hmm. Um, humble, but I could remember I told her drop me off to the gym. I found a job at the gym working in housekeeping. Yeah, I was working in housekeeping, folding towels, sweeping gym floor, having a grand time. I mean, this gym was huge. I mean, it was one of the biggest gyms I've ever seen. Yeah, and I could remember telling her drop me off one day because I was tired of depending on her to taking me to work. I'm a grown ass man at this point. Yeah. And uh, I literally slept in the gym because I was the opener. I opened the gym. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I had the keys, the alarm codes, all of that. Yeah. When the gym closed, I would go back like after about 9, 10 o'clock, open the gym, go in the massage room, sleep on the table, wake up. I mean, the shower was some of the best showers and gels and lotion they had. It was like a a legit gym. Yeah. We're glad. And I can remember <laughs> that. And um, that, that right there in itself was like, it's either you go home. And figure it out or you start to figure it out now. And that was pretty much my journey into moving back home and and just, you know, starting a fitness business and working my way to the top. Okay. So would you say it's something where you just gain momentum and you just start challenging yourself more to do more difficult things so you could, I guess, achieve those dreams that you always had inside? I I think everything was a situation. Yeah. Move back home. And again, what do I do? Right? What? I don't have a degree. You see what I'm saying? So I can't just pull up to somebody's job and say I need fifty thousand dollars a year. Blah blah blah. No, I don't have that. I found a job through a friend because you know in the Bahamas it's who you know. Yeah. So if you know the right people, <laughs> then certain things might move a little bit faster. Yeah. Started working at the casino, Atlantis Casino, in security. Mm-hmm. I was a security officer making. We were making like about eight dollars an hour. Thank God for the cafeteria, the free lunch. Yeah, and uh, you know the added benefits you get, which is you know somewhat good for somebody who you know doesn't know yeah, much. Yeah, I think uh, within about eight months I got a promotion and supervisor, and it just you know things just started happening. Mm-hmm. I think for me, I hate to be stagnant. I hate to be in a place where I'm better than everybody. I hate to be in a place where it's just stuff is not moving mm-hmm. because. The way it looks for me is if I don't make it to the very top, wherever that is, because there's no ceiling for that. Yeah. I don't have a ceiling. Is all right, I got a gym. Now what do I do? No, I need another gym. Or if it's not a gym, it's some other business venture I want to get into or something I'm passionate about. Yeah. Because I think that's what brings the joy of what I do when I train a client is the passion behind it. 
picking up a camera is the passion about, you know, being artistic because I was an artist growing up. Yeah. So that's a part of me. Everything I do is a part of what I love to do. And I think that's where I'm more successful now than just trying to make a dollar. That is real. <laughs> I mean, so I feel like that's why when certain like situation where you have like, how you're certified as a master trainer now, right. most people would shy away from that when they look at the percentages and be like, right. that's impossible to do. But yeah. with the minds that you already have, you was like, oh, I could just do it and get it. You're right. There <laughs> so, you go. So, you know, it's like, it's the thing about failure is it's a lot of people have that fear yeah. of rejection. Right. When they when they fail, they, they feel like they're rejected. Mm -hmm. That's that's not how you look at it. That's how you actually get better. Yeah. Any successful person will tell you that, you know, some of them, they got it fast. Some got it really slow. But you have to be able to deal with rejection. And sometimes it could be family. Sometimes it could be friends. Yeah. But if you don't understand rejection, then you don't you will never understand success because if I understand, okay, I failed, now I have to sit back and analyze and ask myself, well, why did I fail? Yeah. Now, how do I improve? How do I get better? And that's pretty much the whole ideal of, you know, I can get better from, from true failure. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I did. I was like, wow, okay, it didn't work out. What do I do? How do I pivot? How do I... How do I make more grounds to get back to where I was? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess with that, I mean, Bahamian people look at your success now. And they look, they go past your gyms and look in awe. Does right. that make you feel kind of uncomfortable? Like, how does that feel to you? Honestly, I really don't look at it that way. Okay. But it's the journey is how I got there. Yeah. And a lot of persons, not even, not just Bahamians, but a lot of persons, because we, I guess, live on an island and, and it's so close proximity to the persons you might know. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, whoa, now he doing big things. Yeah. You know, that's our favorite word. Well, he doing big <laughs> things. Well, he doing big things. But yeah. at the end of the day, they didn't see me sleeping in a massage room. Exactly. They did not see me training on Malcolm Park at five in the morning. And um, just trying to figure out how am I going to make it? How am I going to be successful? Mm -hmm. What am I trying to do? What am I sacrificing? Rain, storm, or shine, my class, I don't cancel. I don't. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's about the repetition. repetition yeah. The repetition, the repetition, and then your repetition. Because when people understand this dude don't settle, this dude goes to that next level, they want that more than anything else. I agree. And they want to be around somebody like that more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, going back to Rainstorm or Shine, <laughs> a few <laughs> weeks ago, I saw it was like, what that was, that was like a Saturday like this, but even more, it was like hurricane storm type of thing. Yep. I sleep it in my bed because I don't work out on Saturdays. <laughs> so, anyways, I look, I see on the story mark for 360 posts. Right. Y'all in the middle of the storm doing the boot camp on the beach. Yes. Thunder and lightning. Thunder and lightning, man. That's Ooh. that's something I started. Yeah. You know, I I had a I have a mentor, Todd uh -huh. Durkin. He's actually the uh was the strength coach with Drew Brees and Ladanian Thomason. Okay. So he was the person I seek and reached out to and kind of drove to in San Diego just to meet him in mm. person. And I said to him, I want to be, I want you to be my mentor. Um, I think that mentality he had or has i saw it and yeah. i was kind of in his workspace and i was like this is the guy i want to be this is what i want to be like this gym what he has is what i want to carry home someday and open up yeah and i think just the mentality of no matter what you know what i'm saying if it rained he had class no matter what was going on yeah he made it work and i saw it and i was like so now having that opportunity to do the boot camps on Malcolm Park, ain't no shelter, ain't no bathroom. So it was one of those things where when it rained, I tell them, y'all leave, don't come back. Wow. And you know women, <laughs> behemoth women in their hair. <laughs> yeah. At yeah, the yeah, end yeah. of the don't day, mess with that. <laughs> everybody was like, we ain't going nowhere. And that whole, the mentality, the mindset, and the culture, what I kind of brought, mm -hmm. it shifted. 
So that's why a lot of persons, they love it even more when it rains because the, the burst of energy you get. Yeah. Because you see other crazy people on the side of you and you're like, exactly. I want some of that. Contagious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I feel like, as people say, like, you never feel like terrible that you did a workout afterwards. Right. Yeah. You don't. You don't. I think um, exercise, you know, based on the science, you know, the endorphins and the things that actually happen to you, you know, your nervous system and your body, it just, you can't beat it. No medication, no no surgery. You just can't replace it with anything else. And I think that's why, you know, physical exercise is such a, a huge part in a person's life and everybody should be doing it. I agree. So... I guess within the groups and everyone that you train, is there one worker warrior that just like impresses you like beyond belief? <laughs> um, I, I think the person that impresses me the most is the person who show up, right? It doesn't have to be the physical ability. It's yeah. all mental. You know, I have persons, I have a lady in my class, tore her Achilles. Oh. She tore her Achilles and she wants to work out. Like, she's standing on the side of me. I'm like, what you doing here? (laughs) Yeah. But uh, my doctor just said I can't do. Like, that's the person I want to train. Those are the people I want to, like, be around. Because when you have that mentality of I'll figure it out, Mm -hmm. those are the people you want to be around. Because they'll figure a way to to make stuff happen. I agree. I agree. And what I like about your gym is that even if it's just, like, casual gym goers or to professional athletes, y'all still respect everyone the right. same. Yeah. Yeah. So, and with that, I was like, one after one workout before, I was like, I was getting my shake at the counter. I turn around. Oh, they're back at the door. I look again. I say, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess with you training professional athletes as well, with Odell and Julio and how you got them, how you train with them, do you feel like... Or what kind of impact do you feel like you assisted them with extending their careers? I I think what we, as let's say the average person, like you saw on Odell or Julio next to you getting in shape. Mm. These are people just like us. So our sessions might be intense, but the conversations of us, regular conversation. Yeah. Like, how is your family you know, what's your next move? Like, what's your goals? Mm. Like, these are the conversations we actually have. Like, they are down to earth people like anybody else. They would, they love talking to people. They love being in an environment where people don't acknowledge them, but acknowledge them in a way. Yeah. And they love that. They don't want to be where, hey, I want to get a yeah, photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why they love coming to Mac Fit is because, you know, the local people, we embrace them. We see them. We want a photo for some, mm. but at the end of the day, we don't like, yeah, yeah, you know, try to reach and grab them. Like I was to dinner with Julio, and we was in the casino floor. They're standing up, having conversation, and the amount of like, you know, Americans, they would run up on him. Hey, can I get a photo? And then Julio would be like, "Man, is he even gonna ask if I'm okay? How I'm doing? Yeah. Like stuff like that." Yeah, yeah, and and that's what they that's what they love about coming to the Bahamas is we we treat them like one of ours down the earth. Yeah, I saw somewhere also you said that the Bahamas is the really the thing that's attracting them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we did. I think Cam Newton did a podcast. Mm-hmm. He did a he did a video, and um, he was having a conversation with Julio, and they was talking about. You know, you train in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. And he kind of like really was like, you train in the Bahamas? Like, what's in the Bahamas? Because they only <laughs> understand the Bahamas being like, you know, the yeah, hotel yeah. and the palm trees. But when he walked into Mac Fit, mm-hmm. he stood back, was like, oh, wow. Real class, yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, it kind of like, it changes the mentality. And every pro athlete that walks into the door is the same reaction. Mm-hmm. The same reaction, oh, wow, because now what we're doing, and I'm not saying my fit, the Bahamas, because I always preach everywhere I go, every seminar, the Bahamas. Yeah. I'm an ambassador for this country, mm-hmm. no matter how people look at it. I'm just one of the the holes that these guys can jump in when they come. Yeah. But it's all about you know how I embrace my country as a whole, and these people, they love it. They want more of it. Yeah. 
And it would also like within MarkFit, you still have people who are pushing to get higher certifications. You have people who are right. pushing to compete more and more. Mm-hmm. Like what about the MarkFit culture pushes people towards more? I think a lot of me continue to, I try to push on them because in order for myself to be successful, my team have to be successful. Yeah. I prefer them to have more knowledge than me at the end of the day, because if that happens, then it only drives the engine even better. Um, Not just any certification, get the best certification. Mm -hmm. Not just any workout, have the best class. You know, anybody could put a workout on a piece of paper. Okay, how do you start your session? What goes on in the middle of your session? How do you end your session? It all comes together. Somebody's birthday, we need to understand. We need to acknowledge that person because at the end of the day, you know, you only got one life. Yeah. But when you have a team, a person saying happy birthday, and you're like, I don't even get that home. Yeah. So it brings, a, it's a family environment for our team. It's about how do you get better? What are your goals? Five-year goals. That's our interview questions. Two-year goals. How can we help you? You want to become a trainer? Okay, well, these are the, this is the road you have to go. If you want to be a master trainer, this is what you have to do. If you need my help, I'm here for you. And that's what we do. Yeah, I get that because even if like, the tutorials that you post on Instagram from certain workouts, the way you break it down is where it's like, right. I understand this completely now. <laughs> so like, yeah. the way I knew it initially was like, eh, yeah. I kind of know it, but now I definitely right, right. know it. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I I would love to do more of it, but I, I tend to understand, and this is coming from a personal standpoint, anytime you build a brand, mm-hmm. you know, locally, everybody wants to be the face of their brand. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And I understand that when it gets to a certain point, you have to literally step back mm-hmm. and rebrand. So I'm at a stage where I'm rebranding myself. Okay. I'm stepping away. That's why I try not to post so many of me on the MacFit page because I don't want people to feel like I'm like overcrowding. Yeah. 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 And Bahamians, you know, <laughs> right? So yeah. I'm like, I'm to the point where I'm like, you know, I do have a team. And my team is the most important aspect of the business now, not the business, my team. Mm-hmm. So how do I make them feel on a daily basis is how we grow. I want everybody to feel comfortable. I want everybody to come to work wanting to work because we all have bad days. Yeah. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Customer service is one of our biggest things, but we're not going to have an A game every day. Sometimes, you know, you might rub somebody wrong by what you say or how you look or your mood, but at the end of the day, it's all good. You know, we, we want to have the best customer service and our team by the education and the knowledge and what we do for them. I think it helps. I can respect that. I can I can see it as well. So there's that. Yeah. Well, I have a fun question. Okay. <laughs> um, so given you trained so many athletes already, who is one athlete that you haven't trained who you feel like you can take their game to the next level if they just join your program? Just Jeez. one. Well, that's a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a book. I would love to train Zion Williams. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think Zion Williams is a is a is a freak of nature when you cuz I've seen him played in person. Mm-hmm. My brother played for St. John's. They had a game at Duke. So I flew out to um North Carolina to watch the game. Yeah. The abilities of that kid is ridiculous in person. Yeah. But the mentality. You know, I think his mental capacity has to change uh, as an athlete. Um of the game and you know he's a physical specimen but if he doesn't take care of himself now it, it you know it'd be like another tractor trailer i don't know if you remember that that power forward from michigan back in the day strong he was a he was a he was a great player but he sure. just couldn't keep the weight off his body yeah. look him up tractor trailer okay <laughs> and um but yeah he'd probably be the one guy wow because i'll definitely get into his head if he let me you know what i'm saying i would be like Cause I don't treat my athletes like a celebrity. Yeah, I treat them like the average person. So yeah. he, I don't think he's getting that in his corner, and he needs that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, he's pretty much a walking anomaly. <laughs> so I don't understand it, but yeah, <laughs> that's a good answer. I gotta lie. Mm. But yeah, just going back to, I guess I want to talk about 
me and the boys, right? when we started our gym journey, it was more of we're just working out to get better at sports. Right. Obviously, superficial reasons. <laughs> superficial reasons as well. Right, right. But then as you grow and progress in the gym, you realize the health benefits. The, right. The health with mind and body. And then it also becomes a source for you to challenge yourself. Right. And then that even evolves more into where you challenge yourself outside of the gym. The gym becomes a source for you to challenge yourself in different areas of your life. So I guess, do you see that in a lot of other people as well? When they come to your gym, you see them mm -hmm. pushing for more in life when they I, I go to think, your gym? Um, it's, I mean, if we rewind, we go back mm -hmm. and we think about gyms 10 years ago, we would say 10 years ago. Yeah. Before MacFit, right? It was non existent People who went to the gym were just bodybuilders. Yeah. And a few athletes, mm -hmm. right? And the whole mentality of physical health and then mental focus and stability, the gym plays a big part. And then nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't understand that when you go in there, those endomines kick in. You lift 20 pounds, you lift 30 pounds, six months later, you're hitting 50 pounds. It it turns on, it's a, a signal yeah. clicks. Yeah. You're like, okay, now yeah. I'm starting to look good, feel good. People acknowledging me now. So it's like, now it's, I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. Yeah. And that's what happens is that you always want more now. And that's what I love about, you know, the gyms and the local persons, the local be Bahamian people. Like, they're really taking their physical uh, fitness serious, which is good because, again, at the end of the day, you know, we are unfit nation. So yeah. being able to add these facilities for persons to now have the option and the opportunity to take care of themselves is even better. I agree. I agree. Well, seeing how you... Out of all your success and all that good stuff, is there any, I guess, regrets, mistakes that you have that you would like to, I guess, share with people to have them prevent making those same mistakes when right. they're on pursuit of their dreams? I, I think you have to go through it. Yeah. I think in life, you can't, you can't avoid conflicts. You can't avoid failure. You cannot. Yeah. You could read a book on how to be a motivational speaker. You could be a book on how to not make a mistake, but you will make mistakes. And I think a lot of people downfall is they don't know what to do after they make that mistake. If you're somebody who has too much pride, then you're in the wrong game. Like we have to learn to suck up our pride and, and learn to deal with no matter what people say, I'm going to get it done. Mm -hmm. All right, jump on a bus, catch the bus. But I was driving a Mercedes Benz. So you see the you see the difference, like the yeah. pride, the pride in. I used to drive a Mercedes. I ain't jumping on no bus. <laughs> it's like you ain't got oh, no I'm money. Walking. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like I tell people all the time. I will go outside and wash a car and detail the hell out of that car in the front of my gym, and I do it all the time. Yeah. It's an income. Fail. My bank account is going to go up. Also so true. <laughs> what, why am I too big to do that? Because I have two gyms, successful gyms, and other businesses going on. No. Because I love doing it. See, that's the difference. I love doing it. I would do it because I love doing it. Yeah. It's not because of the money. But when, when I'm done washing that car in the hot, like 12, 1 o'clock, mid-top sun... The car is going to be clean. The client is going to have a great experience. And at the end of the day, I could do 10 more cars if I wanted to. But I'm not shying away from being doing the small thing. Yeah. Picking up the trash off my gym floor, or sweeping the floor, or getting up 2.30 in the morning, getting to the gym early and sweeping and vacuuming and making sure that the stage is set for when every member comes in. We can't forget the small things of what got us there. And the minute we start doing those things, that's when everything goes haywire. Yes, so that's fair. Well, <laughs> Do you have any more questions, Kadero? Bring got, them. Bring I got the questions. One, I got man. one more. Bring you know, I get the final one. But do you have any questions? <laughs> it's just, 
I, I've been so like enthused in the show in this episode just behind it. I, I'm finding even though I'm working behind the scenes, right. I'm like watching like a fan instead of like actually being active in this episode. So you gotta excuse me for that. But <laughs> you good. Um how do you stay the course? Right? Because mm-hmm. like, you know, you've you've had people, I guess, talk to you. I don't know if you have any like negative influences throughout the year when you're dealing with your um basketball dream. Right. Right. How do you stay the course? Because you know, you said you said it, you didn't get you didn't get the scholarship when you finished school. Right, correct. Right. So a lot of people would see that as the end, right? So a lot of people would see that as, okay, well, well, time to do something else. Me and the Bahamas. Right. So it's not like we're it's not like a lot of people are afforded to chase their dreams once they hit that rocky wall. And right. good thing you did, because who knows where you would have been or who knows what you would have done um, without pursuing your dreams. So how do you stay the course and what do you tell someone else? How do you tell someone else to stay on their dream? Mm-hmm. Even though that dream may seem a little blurry. Right. How do you get them? How, well, what are, you, what are words are you going to use to push them to stay on that? You, you know, <laughs> I love the question because... I think a lot of it is happening in our society today. You know, persons want to know which word am I going to use to make me feel a certain way to get up and keep it going. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you hear a motivational speaker speak and all of these different things, Eric Thomas, I'll name a couple, right? And you're like, oh, okay, get up and shake it off and, you know, live, what does it say, breathe, some of that sort. At the end of the day, you got to get your butt up. At the end of the day, you just got to get your butt up and 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 make something happen. Like physically do something to make it happen. Whether it's exercise, whether it's a new job, whether it's just a new relationship or trying to avoid certain people or relationships. People just got to take action. If you don't take action, it doesn't make sense to write a script. You write a script, but if you don't take action, nothing's going to happen. Take action. Be the person to say, all right, let me knock on this door. No. Okay. No. No. But you need to knock harder. Because there's something that's going on, and the reason you're not getting what you need is because you're not doing something, or maybe it's just not for you. Sometimes you got to know when it's for you and when it's not. And after that fourth and fifth north, seven and eight and nine, and ain't nothing happening, now I need to figure something else out. I need to move on. I have a YouTube channel. I do all my social media for MacFit, all of my videos. I create everything. I bought some of the best cameras. But at the end of the day, that's not going to make me a better person or creator. Now I have to go back and learn and learn and learn and put in the 10,000 hours and learn until I get it. And that's only the camera. I'm not talking about now I have to market myself. Now I have to sell this and, and how people believe in my work. But if you're not taking the action steps to improve on what you're trying to get or do, how do you expect somebody to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? You have to be able to believe in yourself by taking action. You know that thing, jump? You got to jump. Like, literally, you got to jump. With the fear of, okay, if I get rejected, oh, well, I'm going to keep it moving. That's it. Keep it moving. Take the action steps to get better. What, um, I guess, what kind of person is the hardest person to train? The hardest person to train is somebody who do not believe in whatever it is they're trying to do. Because if you're going to pay me, and this is how I am now, yeah. if you're going <laughs> to pay me to train you and you said, oh, uh, it's too heavy, no, you got to go. I'm sorry. You're not declining for me. You're not even trying. Because see, the thing is, I've been doing it so long. If I put 315 pounds in front of you and say, deadlift that, because I understand you because I've trained you. So I know the abilities of every person that comes in the door. If it's your first time, I already know where to start with you, right, by assessing you. But if I have a client that's always, oh, I can't, oh, I can't, oh, something's going on up here. Yeah. 
Because at the end of the day, if you didn't try, just like the taking the action, it's not going to be a fun relationship. So I might as well stop now and you go that way and I go that way. Because it's about my energy too. And I'm all about keeping my mentality and my mental space free. <laughs> okay. Well, we got one final question here. Tradition at Fanatic Islanders. Um, we want to know what it is you're most fanatical about in your life right now. Man, my family. And um, so, you know, in all seriousness, right, like when, when I say family, family is anybody who puts you in a position to have success or friends. Anybody who is pushing you, who is keeping you uncomfortable and unstable. Because when you're uncomfortable and un unstable, you, you have to adapt. Yeah. And I've learned that, you know, having an opportunity to um, go from training on the park to now having two fitness facilities where people come in and relieve stress, like, that's an opportunity, right? And having a family base that keeps me, you know, grounded and support everything I do. That's that's so important because, you know, my wife, she runs the day to day operations. You know, we have two kids, 12 and eight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how I was raised and grew up. Some of it I didn't want them to experience some of it, not all of it, some of it by being able to give them a better education. My daughter spoke did Spanish, French for one year. Now she speaks it fluently in less than two years, fluently. That's an experience. That's yeah. an opportunity now that I never had, right? My little boy, he plays soccer, not basketball. I'm not the parent who's going to be like, well, I play basketball, so he have to yeah. play. No, I'm not that parent. I'm not the parent to, no, because I've seen it. I've seen the AAU tournaments. I've been there. I've seen the parents destroying these kids, right? It's all about me being able to provide for my family now and have the opportunity to help people outside of, you know, the gym. Because, you know, I have a foundation where we go to Camp Road every year. And we do like a little giveaway and do stuff. Yeah. Or if some people <clears throat> reach out to me, I would, you know, do stuff and help if I can and I think that speaks more volume than anything is being able to give back. And I think that's my reason. My reasoning for doing everything I do for my family and then the ability to give back. The people who need it, not just because you're a friend, that means I need to give you. Yeah. No, don't don't get that twisted. It's a difference between a person who can't really do it and who can. And so that's pretty much like everything about me, man. It's like, I'm a simple dude. I like my space. I like my time. I'm a quiet guy. And, um, but when it comes to work and business, I'm a different person. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a totally different person, but cause I understand, you know, what it takes. Cause at this moment you could lose it just like that. Mm -hmm. It could be lost. So for me being able to hold on to that and that's why my team, I keep them at a certain, like, yo, no, no, no. Tighten it up. My wife, if something's not going right, she tell me first. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> if I'm doing right or wrong. Yeah. And if she's not doing her part, I'll tell her. Because at the end of the day, that communication line have to keep going. Yeah. And the minute we stop communicating and everything falls apart. Agreed. Yeah, everything falls apart. But yeah, man, my family is, is the biggest thing. That's the perfect way to end it right yeah. now. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on. Wow. I mm. think I think everybody watching got a lot just now. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, I could go all day man, <laughs> with, with the experiences yeah. and, and the life lessons. But, you know, the biggest life lesson for me is, you know, God first. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, family and, and, and then just your ability to go out there and make it happen every day. Because it's we all in a sense, robots. Honestly, like when you think about it, you get just up. Just got to program it. You do this, you do this, you do that, you do that. Yeah. Some people just program different. Mm -hmm. They want to do it when they feel like doing it. Yeah. 
and, and, and nine times out of 10, they're probably unsuccessful in a lot of areas of their lives. But habits are the thing that carries us, how we create. I was listening literally to Gilbert Arenas. I posted it on my page. Yeah. And he talked about somebody asked him, you know, being a, a wealthy athlete after your career at 32. Yeah. What do you do? Now, he was like, I'm unhappy. He said that. I'm unhappy. He was like, because he was so programmed from a six-year-old to a 32-year-old playing ball every day, every day, every day, every day. He was so accustomed to when a certain time of the year, okay, it's time to go into training camp, blah, blah, blah. Now he can't do none of it. So he was like, literally, he drives two hours for no reason. No reason just driving because... He doesn't know what to do with himself as an athlete. And I think a lot of athletes nowadays, yeah. they, don't, they don't understand that when it's over, it's over. I was fortunate enough to use training athletes and training clients to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. Because I'm still competing in that arena. Yeah. Right? So I was like, wow. Like, I'm still having fun. Like, I played the game, but I'm not playing it. I don't even pick up a basketball I haven't played ball in over 10 years, like literally. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get away from the sport before. I was one of those guys always running back to the sport. Yeah, let go. Living living that old memory. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You seem like you're always able to find a new drive or whatever. Right, right, exactly. So, I think you just live life. To be fair. You got it. You got it. Yeah, that's all you do. I I just live life and do the things I love to do. Yeah. That's it, Dale. Get there you want to take us out. <laughs> sure. Uh, there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Fanatic Islanders Sandbar Sit Down. Mr. Mackey, thank you for coming on. Thank Appreciate you for giving it. us your insight. I'm sure you touch a lot of lives as you touch ours today. And welcome back anytime. Yes, sir. Man, I, I'll should definitely be back. Appreciate Just it. Say the word, man. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>